Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome everyone. We appreciate your presence. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in the Northside Baptist Church in Athens, Georgia. And this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping that now we're coming up, we can be an inspiration to everyone. I have a very important letter here from Mr. Randolph Holder from WNGC. I want to read to you. It might be a little shocking, but you listen to uh, the letter as I read it, dated September the 10th, 1988. Dear Virgil, the annual board meeting of Clark Broadcasting Corporation was held on September the 7th, 1988. The board has decided on a major program in chains for radio station WNGC, which among other things will eliminate religious programming during weekdays, Monday through Saturday. As of October the 2nd, Sundays will remain as they are. For this reason, the board has directed me to write to you and tell you of its decision and to give you at least two weeks notice the impending deadline. And so your last week's program will be October the 1st. The board has asked that I express our appreciation for our long and pleasant relationship with the Blessed Hope over the years. They do wish to maintain your Sunday service as a valuable part of our Sunday programming. The quality of the Blessed Hope has always been good. It served the need of many people in the past, but the board has perceived a time for change. This is only a part of the new program in directing which the board has decided to go. It is a step we take reluctantly, but necessarily, sincerely, H. Randolph Holder, President. Next Saturday will be our last daily broadcast from the classic city of Athens, Georgia, according to this letter. Some 40 years ago, God put us on the air here in Athens as a witness, to give out the gospel, and God moves in 40 uh, circles, many times, uh, cycles, and uh, all through the Bible. If you check on 40 years, uh, many people rule 40 years. Many things happen after 40 years. And so we, our 40-year ministry is coming to a close. Our daily broadcast on WNGC. I deeply appreciate the years I've been on that station, some 19 and some 21 years on another station. God has kept us on the air through his people. Many thousands have been blessed as people in heaven today because of the ministry. There's preachers preaching, there's missionaries on the field, there's churches been established, and a lot of great comfort and encouragement has gone out to thousands as a result of our ministry of uh, more than 40 years daily from Athens. It's a witness, it's now gone on the record, and that record will face the judgment, the city of Athens, everyone who's had a chance to hear the broadcast, uh, will face the record at the judgment seat of Christ or at the end of life's journey, the great white throne judgment of God. And I most certainly appreciate it. Now I appreciate the fact that we're going to be able to maintain our Sunday broadcast. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, if I hope you'll be able to pick us up on Sunday. I do hope that many of our weekday listeners will be able to pick us up on Sunday. I know many of them will be in their own church. And of course, uh, maybe others that could get us on Sunday that got us through the week. And I want uh, uh, the, the people at WNGC to know I appreciate the 19 years I've been on the station and the kindness extended toward me by Mr. Holder and others there at radio station WNGC. But time has come, and so be it. If that's what way it should be, uh, then we'll say goodbye to our radio listening audience next Saturday, which have been, of course, a real joy and thrill to my heart over the past 40 years. This is something beyond my control. I'd like to stay on the air till Jesus comes. Uh, I got disabled, God called me home, but that's not within my power. But I do appreciate everything that's been accomplished. I covet your prayers. I want you to write to me and pray for me as we might move forward in the future. And uh, 
you out in the radio listening audience, I want you to write to me next week if you appreciated our daily program for 40 years. All right, to me and let me know. I appreciate it very much and mean much to me. And write in, get our brochure on our post Holy Land tour, and get my book on 52 Seven Point Outlines on the Holy Spirit. You can get Brother David Lewis's book on the Song of Solomon, and also get a list of some 340 of our cassette tape. We tape our Sunday morning programs every Sunday. We have them available. And so we want you to write in, get a list. You might want to order some, the tape of $3 each. And my book on the Holy Spirit is $4. And then add some extra and get the book on the Song of Solomon by Brother Lewis. We'd like to hear from you. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. And so let me hear from you next week and pray for me. Of course, without saying, this is kind of a sad situation for me. It's part of my life. After you've been doing something more than 40 years daily, and then, of course, when it comes to a close, it's always a sad situation for those that's engaged in it. So for me and my dear wife, that has been our faithful secretary over the years in our radio ministry. And it's, uh, of course, it brings a note of sadness to our heart. And you hear that members of Northside Baptist Church, I know you feel the same way, but uh, many in the radio listen audience will feel badly about not being able to get the message of blessed hope each day. But you pray that God might direct our footsteps as we sojourn for him. I want you to turn, would you please, to 2 Kings chapter 3. I'm speaking today on this subject, digging ditches. Digging ditches. 2 Kings chapter 3. I want you to turn there, will you please? And it's page, um, uh, let's see, page 424 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Page 424. Now, speaking about ditches, I'm... Um, in mind of these two fellows, one real hot summer day digging a ditch. One was named Willie, the other named Leroy. And they were working away digging a ditch that hot summer day. And uh, Willie said to Leroy, I said, Leroy, I said, uh, somebody's deodorant is not, is not working. Leroy said, said, it ain't mine. I said, it must be yours. I said, I don't use the stuff myself. All right, you turn to 2 Kings chapter 3. I want to read a few verses found there. Now let me tell you something about the chapter before I read my text. We have here three kings going in to fight the army of Moab, the Moabites people. And so we have three kings together. We have the king of Israel, we have the king of Judah, and we have the king of Edom. Now the king of Israel had been paying tax to the taxes to the king of or Moab, brother had been paying taxes to the king of Israel, and they've been giving hundreds of sheep and cattle and so forth each year there to the king of Israel. Now the king of Israel, of course, was enjoying the good uh, commitment coming in from the king of Moab every year, but the king of Moab decided I'm not going to pay any more taxes to the king of Israel. And I just refused to do it. And when they refused to do it, the king of Israel called on the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. If he wouldn't come and join his forces with their forces, and they would go in and reconquer the Moabites people and uh, command them or demand that they pay those taxes. And then they had to go through the land of Edom. And so they persuaded the king of Edom to go along with them. So here we have three kings, the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, the king of, of Israel, and the king of Edom, all joined their forces together to go and attack the king of the Moabites people of their nation. And so they get together and began to move forward to conquer the Moabites people. And with that in mind, I want you to look at verse 16. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches, for thus saith the Lord, ye shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that you may drink, both ye and your cattle, and your beasts. After this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord, 
he will deliver the Moabites also into your hands. And you shall smite every fenced city and every choice city and shall fell every good tree and stop all wells of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered that behold, there came water by the way of Edom and the country was filled with water. And when all the Moabites heard that the kings were coming up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. And they rose up early in the morning and the sun shone upon the water and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, this is blood. The kings are surely slain. They are smitten one another. Now therefore Moab to the spoil. And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. But they went forward, smiting the Moabites in their own, even in their own country. Now that's reading from 2 Kings chapter 16, verses, uh, chapter 3, rather, verses 16 through verses, verse 24. Now I want to take a look at this scripture. I'd like to enlarge upon it. And there's some truth here for our hearts. But keep in mind some things happening here in this great chapter. As I explained uh, just a few moments ago, there were three great armies. Here you find three armies well equipped. You find the army of Israel. And you find the army of Judah. And you find the army of Edom. They're all well equipped armies. And it seemed that they could go in and conquer most any land. They desired to do so in those days. Because they were so well equipped. Now that's where it is in many of our churches today. There's never been a time when we've had uh, larger buildings, nicer buildings, a more highly educated ministry, better trained workers and singers and teachers in the churches today than in this hour. Never been a time when we had more of them and better buildings and more beautiful buildings, but we have less power with God today than we've ever had in the history of the Christian church. I believe that with all of my heart. We have a lot of people they play in religion, saying we have need of nothing, we are rich, and we have um, our train choirs, our robe choirs, we have our padded pews, and we have our glass windows, we have our highly educated ministers, we have our trained musicians and singers, we have plenty of money coming into the treasure, and man, we got it made. And they're saying that all over America today in many of our large churches. But one thing they don't have that they don't realize is they don't have God. They don't have the power of the Holy Ghost. They're playing religion, but without Jesus Christ, without his power. Now, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17, because I says I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. There God gives a description of the Laodicean church in this Laodicean state of the church age. And that's exactly where we are today. Our big shot churches in many of our large cities today will play religion, well equipped, very wealthy, well dressed people. Uh, men with, with uh, huge incomes and, and things of that type. And in the church, less power with God Almighty than we've ever had. What we need today is power with God. We need the power of God's Spirit. It's not more highly educated preachers. It's not better trained workers. It's not nicer pews and better robe choirs and stained windows we need today and carpet floors. That's not what we need. We need the power of the Holy Spirit of God. I'd rather be out on an old tabernacle with wooden beaches and sawdust on the floor and have the power of God upon my preaching and my ministry than being the best, most qualified, best qualified church today in any large city and have not the power of God. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Now these three armies all march forward, but there's one thing like, and we'll show you that in just a moment. They were well equipped. They had the fighting material. They had the men and they moved forward, but there's something like him. And number two, they noticed an alarming discovery. They had no water. 
They had no water. I don't care how large your army may be, how fast you may move forward, but if you don't have any water and can't get any water, you're in bad shape. You won't last very long. Now these three armies discovered they had no water. The Bible said in verse 9, And there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. So they had no water for beast or man, and they were moving forward to attack the Moabites' people and no water. Now they couldn't last long without water. You know what a little drought does in the state of Georgia during the summer months? Well, it just seemed like um, uh, we just can't get over it. I would notice the, the Hartville Lake over yonder and the thing's still going down. And you'd think maybe we have a little rain, it might arise an inch or so, but it, it's going down every week over there still yet. And it would take a lot of water to fill the lakes in North Georgia and the Hartwell Lake and these other lakes because of a little drought that hit Georgia. Now, without water, you can be paralyzed, no doubt about it. In Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3, I will pour water upon him that's thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I'll pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessings upon thine offspring. Now, here God said if we want the water... If we want the power of God's Spirit, then He can give it to us. And if we'll pay the price, He said, I'll pour water upon him that's thirsty. You can't have it unless you're thirsty. You'll never be filled with the Spirit of God unless you're thirsty. In John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive for the Holy Ghost is not yet given because of Jesus was not yet glorified now he said if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink no man will be filled with the Holy Spirit unless he has a holy thirst for the fullness of God's Spirit unless he's willing to pay the price unless he's willing to say Lord here am I I want you to control my life and you got to get so hungry and so thirsty for the fullness of God's Spirit that you're willing to give up anything for the cause of God or you're not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. God's not going to just fill everyone that comes along careless, unconcerned, in a cursed manner, trying to carry on religious work. There must be a longing, a there must be a hunger, there must be a thirst in our lives. I will never be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. God wants to send the floods. God wants to send the rain. God wants to send the, uh, the uh, uh, great downpour. God wants to send the gully washer in our lives. I'm speaking about uh, our spiritual lives. I'm, th I'm thinking about the fullness of God's Spirit. God wants to wash out and clean out everything that's not right in our lives. There's a woman one day that, that uh, was praying with a pastor and praying about rain. And he got out in the business and he was talking to God. He said, Lord, I, I want you to uh, really send a rain. Lord, I want you to really uh, send a flood. Lord, I want you to really send a downpour. Lord, I want you to send a real trice mover. I want you to send a real gully washer. Lord, I want you to move the trash. And about that time, this woman stopped him, said, Preacher, said, leave the trash moving part off because I just buried my husband today. Well, we need to realize that God can send a trash mover. God can send a gully washer. God can send the downpour. God can send the Spirit of God upon us. But we've got to be willing to pay the price. We find in John chapter 4 that there was a woman that came to the well there to get some water. And she was thirsty for that uh, literal water. Uh, she got out of the well, physical water. But Jesus told her about the water of life. About the Spirit of God that could come in her. And she could drink of that water and never thirst again. Now what people need today is the Holy Spirit. What that sinner needs out there is, is the Spirit of God in his heart. And the only way he'll get it is repenting of his sins and believing on Christ as his Savior except in him. And so God Almighty can send the rain. Number three, there was a call for a Holy Spirit preacher. There was a call for a Holy Ghost preacher, if you please. Please. There's never been a time in the history of the world today when we need old-fashioned 
Holy Ghost preachers, Bible preachers, gospel preachers anymore than in this hour in which we live. There's never been a time when we need to get the gospel out by every means possible anymore. The need's never been any greater than in this hour in which we live. We have dope, we have whiskey, we have murders, robbers, we have these liberal infidel uh, judges that's turning criminals loose, overturning uh, uh, the convictions of death penalists, and just turn them back out on the streets. Beloved, we're headed toward hell, and this world of nations going to hell, and nobody seems to care anything about the gospel, getting the gospel out, trying to curb the situation, trying to do anything about it. Everybody would rather go down the broad road, to uh, go down the, the road of popularity, and let people die and go to hell and God destroy this nation than to be concerned about getting out the gospel. Beloved, we need to get the gospel. They need the Holy Ghost preacher here. They needed a man of God. And the Bible said in verses 11 and 12, But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire the Lord by him? And one of the kings of Israel, a servant answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat came. The king of Edom went down to him. They went down to talk to the old preacher. This old bald-headed Elisha was sitting down there with the power of God on him. They said, We need, we need a preacher. We need somebody that can get an answer from God. We need somebody that can tell us what to do. We need somebody that believes in God and believes the Bible. That's the cry I need this hour. This little social gospel is sending people to hell. This little air tickling and backbiting, uh, scratching others, sending people to hell. We need old-fashioned preachers that will believe the Word of God and preach the gospel. That's the need of this hour. We're living in some serious days, momentous days and perilous times as certain as I'm speaking to you today. We need somebody that can get the job done. And they said there's no preacher down here by the name of Elisha. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah and he's got God on him. He's got the Holy Spirit with him. And if we can get him to come and help us out, we're in a terrible mess. We don't have any water. If we can get that man of God to come and help us, then we can continue on our mission. And so these three kings go down and they begin to talk uh, to Elisha. Of course, as one of these kings knew God. Uh, we find Jehoshaphat knew God. And Elisha said, all right, I'll take in consideration what you want. But were it not for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even talk to you. I wouldn't even talk to you. So they talked to Elisha. He could get the job done. There's a businessman one time wanted to hire a man to handle his business for him. And three men came in to apply for the job. And he didn't know which one to hire. And he put a question to him. And he uh, said to him, he said, uh, fellas, let me ask you a question. I want you to give the answer one at a time. He said there's a man one time that heard a varmint out in his chicken house, destroyed his chickens, and he grabbed his gun, he ran out there, and he fired away. All right, any question? One man said, yes, sir, I have a question, sir. said, uh, uh, what kind of uh, gun did he have? What did he use? He told him. The other man said, well, uh, sir, I have a question. said, what kind of ammunition did he use? He told him. The other man said, sir, what I want to know is, did he get the animal? Did he get the varmint? Did he get him? He said, you got the job, son. He said, you're concerned about getting the job done. Did the man get the job done? Did he kill that animal that's destroying his chickens? Did he get the animal? That's what he's concerned about. He got, did he do the job? And he said, I want a man to run my business that's concerned about getting the job done. And so you have some men today that can get the job done. You need a man of God that can do the job, that can get the job done. And that's the crying need of the hour, getting the job done for God. Then we come to thought number four, and that is mercy for another's sake. In verse 14, And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely were it not thy regard the prayer of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, not even see thee. This old preacher said, I'm going to tell you fellas something. 
you son of uh, Ahab and, and you uh, king of Edom, I'm going to tell you something. This preacher looked those three men in the face. He said, were it not for this man here, the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, this man of God that knows God, I, I wouldn't even speak to you. I'd waste not my time on you. Now, I can't understand why Jehoshaphat came down and joined that crowd anyway. He was an independent Baptist. What did he come down there and join that other group for? Oh, you listen to me. That's a trouble today. You have too many today who want to unite and, and promote union campaigns, hobnob around and play around, compromise and join everything that comes along uh, in order to try to get something done. That's not the way to do it. That's not the way it's to be done. God is looking for a man. That's willing to pay the price and move forward and not join up with all of these different cliques and denominations and all these other movements that's coming along. Never, never. That's not the way to do it. And we need to realize that God said, Come out among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive him. He said, Were it not for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even look at you. I wouldn't waste my time on you. Any time an old-fashioned, Bible-believing, fundamental, Independent Baptist preacher lines up with a bunch of compromises. He might as well to go home. He's not going to get nothing done. God is looking for men that stand for the truth. That will believe the book. That will preach the Bible. And set out to get the job done. He said were it not for Jehoshaphat. I wouldn't help you. But he said because of him. I'm going to help you out. Because of him. Now he had no business lining up with those two other kings anyway. They were God haters. Wicked, ungodly. Jehoshaphat shouldn't united with them. It's wrong for a man to do a thing like that. Even a nation on army. And so he's willing then to show a little mercy. And he said, all right, I'll show you a little mercy. And I'll go along with you and I'll try to help you. You find in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9. I won't have time to go into it. But it tells you there about a man by the name of Mephibosheth. A crippled man. A son of Saul that was brought in the king's palace for his father Jonathan's sake. He was Jonathan's son and a grandson of Saul. And he was brought in to David's palace. A crippled man brought into David's palace, sat down at David's table with David's servants and children, and sat there and ate with the king in David's palace. Poor old crippled man, a son of Jonathan, a grandson of a, a king Saul. Why did David bring that man in? Jonathan and David were good friends, very close friends. And Jonathan said, David said, uh, don't, don't forget me. Said, I know you're going to be king of Israel. And uh, I, I don't forget me when you're king of Israel. Remember me, David. And David said, Jonathan, you've been a real bosom friend of mine. I most certainly remember you. I surely will. David ascended to the throne in later years. He happened to think about his promise to his good old friend Jonathan. Jonathan had been killed. And now he thought about it. I promised him. I wonder if he has any descendants anywhere yet alive. And they began to look around and they found Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was in a, a land of no pasture over there hid away hiding from King David. And David said, go fetch that man and bring him here. Sit him down at my table. Treat him just like he was my son. And why did David do that? David did that because of his father, that is Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan. It wasn't Mephibosheth. It was Jonathan he did it for his sake because he promised his good friend that he would do it. And so we find Elisha said, all right, I'll go along with you. I'll do this job here for Jehoshaphat's sake, and, and uh, were it not for him, I would not do it. And then notice number five, a foolish demand. Now the Bible said God choose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. They wanted what in the world is Elisha going to do? Is he going to pray some rain down from heaven? What's he going to do? And you find this man, full of the Spirit of God, did a very foolish thing. And sometimes it seems in the eyes of this world, that's what preachers do, men that know God and serve God. In verse 16, he said, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. He said, uh, fellas, get down there and do some ditch digging. The preacher said, get your men down there and put ditches all over this valley. 
dig some ditches. That's my subject today, and this is tape number 349. In case somebody want to write in for it, get it. Dig in ditches. Go down and dig some ditches. God choose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And he cried and said, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Now that, that seems crazy. Oh, that seemed like a, a stupid thing to do. But you look back at God and what God has done rather in days gone by and see the great hand of God, what God has done through men. Uh, many is called in the ministry, some off the farm, uh, some offer uh, out of the plants and some from truck driving and various other walks of life. God has called them into the ministry and took them and made something out of them. See, God's no respect of person. It, you don't have to go out here and tramp around over the campuses of our colleges and universities to try to find a well, highly educated man to try to get him to minister. No, no, God doesn't do it that way. You don't find them like that. God chooses the man he wants. Whether he's educated or not, God can educate him. God chooses that man and God anoints him and God gives him the message. And God says, go after it, son, I'm with you. That's what God does. Now we find here this is a seem to be a foolish thing. Take your soldiers, send them down there, dig some ditches. No doubt they said, what in the world does that crazy preacher want us to dig ditches for? What is that for? We, we don't need ditches, we need water. We're about to starve to death. Our cattle are about to starve to death. And he said, go dig some ditches. And he did a foolish thing, a foolish command, and they went. Number six, notice after he said that, he said, uh, I want a little music around you. Let's have a little music and have uh, the music, uh, music, musicians to play and maybe some singing. Verse 15, now bring me the minstrel. It will come to pass when the minister plays that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Music is a great help in the ministry. A wonderful help in the ministry. A music director that's dedicated to God can accomplish great things through that ministry. And it's needed. Great preachers like, like Dwight L. Moody had uh, Sankey with him doing his ministry. My, what they did together for God. Other great preachers, Billy Sunday had Road Heaver with him doing his ministry. What a wonderful job they did for God. Pastors have had good music directors in their church that's worked with them in doing a wonderful job. And I believe when we get to heaven, the pastor and his music director will stand together and be rewarded together at the judgment seat of Christ because he has a part in all the pastor's ministry. The pastor has a part in his ministry because he sets the stage, gets the people in the mood for the message, and does what he can to get the job done. And that's what God wants, and God calls men for that purpose. And that's a very important ministry. Don't take it lightly. A lot of men that's called in the musical realm is doing far greater job than most preachers. And that's a ministry not to take lightly. Somebody said, well, I don't want to be a music director. I want to be a preacher. If you're a good music director, brother, you're head and shoulders above many preachers. If you got that ability and that talent, then you serve God right there. That's where God wants you. God will bless you for it. Don't get your eyes out yet on the ministry. Preachers are dying today and church leaving churches and churches caving in. And what you need to do is stay by your guns in that field if you're called to that field. Now, he said, send some music. They got some music and they played the music. And then David, you know, whenever a soul became depressed and little David go in and take that harp and there he'd play on that harp and, and the evil spirits would leave old King Saul. Now you can drive the devil out of a church house and good old gospel songs like Amazing Grace and How Firm a Foundation, the old rugged cross and songs like that. You can just run the devil clean out of the house. And you need to do that and clean him out, get him out and let the preacher come in and then preach the word of God. Now they had to have some music and then things happened. Little David run the devil out of King Saul and uh, got him in some shape so he could talk to him uh, through his music. That can happen. Number seven, finally, I want you to notice the mystery of the Spirit. Verses 17 and 18. Thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be lifted with water, that you may drink both ye and your cattle and, uh, and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will live with the Moabites also in your hands. Now what happened when they dug those trenches, God just filled them up with water. 
God filled them up with water. The cattle drank. The soldiers drank. The captains drank. They all drank that good old sparkling water as much as they could hold. And they cured their thirst. But that's not all. Those Moabitish people on the hill on the other side, the next morning when the sun began to rise, that sun was shining on that water and turned that water red and it looked just like blood. There more, those Moabites said, look, those kings over there, three kings in the army, they have fallen out with each other. They got in a fight. They have destroyed each other. Look down in that valley, completely filled with blood down there. Look blood they said yes that's what happened let's go forward now and conquer them and they took off down through the valley and of course when they got into the valley they found there was nothing but water and then they ran right into those three big armies and those three armies turned and ran them out and 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 whipped them and and conquered them and they got the victory now the man of god is the man that directed the way there's never been in it any hour any when there's in a greater need for a real man of God than in this hour in which we live. Digging ditches to the glory of God. See, God worked two miracles. He filled the ditches full of water, and then he made the water look like blood. And he worked her both ways there and gave the victory. God is able to give the victory. You may have to dig some ditches, but God will give the victory to the glory of God. You listen well. Let's stand to our feet. Father in heaven, I pray today you'll use the message that you stir our hearts. God, you're still a miracle work in God, and you can still do that that needs to be done. I pray, dear Father, that you'll have your way in this invitation, that you'll use this message out in the vast radio listening audience. And may Jesus be glorified because we pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Debbie, you play for us, will you? And while you're playing, we... If anybody needs to come forward to be saved or join the church, rededicate their life or whatnot, you may come while we wait. How about it? Somebody coming down the front. Somebody never been down here before. Little Becky, or Rebecca, you coming to dedicate it to the Lord. Tony Fowler is coming to dedicate your little daughter to the Lord. How wonderful, how gracious.